from here to there. So probably already some of you are there with your heart just doing like this. So thank you very much, um, Prof. Hans uh, Westerhoff, for, for accepting to give the second public lecture. It is the second in the series of three uh, this semester, and it's also an opportunity uh, to invite scholarly community around Stellenbosch and beyond and the public to engage with the STIAs fellows in residence. And we take this opportunity to showcase our South African African fellows, the mid-level career scholars, the ISO LOMSO, and the overseas fellows and artists in residence uh, in respective uh, semesters. So we really set up the presenter because the presenter is showcasing the entire cohort. No pressure here at all. My name is Edward, uh, Professor Edward Chirumira. I'm the director of Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study, and it's my pleasure to welcome you um, and to welcome all the guests that I see here and also some that will be online. And uh, uh, the speaker is going to be introduced by, uh, uh, by Yanni, uh, whom I introduced very shortly and Christoph, uh, Dr. Christoph Poe, our senior program manager, will handle the question and answers. So what I do is to introduce the person that is going to introduce the speaker, and then I sit down. So any responsibilities after that is between Yanni and Christoph. So I start by introducing uh, Professor Jan Hendrik Hofmeyer, we call him Yanni. Uh, Yanni um, is Emeritus Professor of Biochemistry, having served Stellenbosch University for 44 years, where he was a professor and distinguished professor in the Department of Biochemistry, and so you see why he has to introduce Hans. In 2009, as part of HOPE project, Yanni and his philosopher colleague Paul Silius established the Center for Studies in Complexity that eventually transformed into the Stellenbosch University Center for Complexity Studies that you see near uh, the manor house. So you can see that biochems can work with philosophers. Uh, but perhaps the most important element as far as Yanni is concerned is that he's been deeply involved in the establishment of the research program of STIAS, mainly through his work in the Fellowship and Research Program Committee and its Scientific Advisory Committee. Although he claims that he retired, uh, in that aspect he continues to be a valuable resource uh, to the institute, especially to the directorate. So if you see a few problems, a few things that I don't do right, it's because he's advising me not rightly. Uh, but so far, I think he's doing a very good job, and those things that I don't do right are my responsibility. I do not want to introdu my introduction of him to compete with his introduction of Hans, uh, and suffice it to note that Yanni is an internationally acclaimed scholar, prolific scientific writer, with several awards and, and fellowships to his name. And he got his first of three A-rated evaluation records by the South African National Research Foundation in 1999. Followed that up in 20, 20, 2001, 2010, um, and a few others that he doesn't tell us. Um, Yanni uh, is an avid painter. And, and, and he usually, if, if you want the best paintings about steers, especially the manor house, go to Yanni. So on that note, I would like to uh, ask Yanni, may you please do us the honor of presenting uh, Professor Hans Westerfeld. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Edward. Painter, I'm not so sure about the Sketcher is better, I think. <laughs> Quick sketcher. So it's a great honor for me to, to be able to introduce my colleague and friend, Hans Westerhoff. Um, 
I'm, I'm going to tell you a story and it's sort of going back in time. So the first mists of time that we go back to is the Stias mist of time, that's the year 2000. Stias had just been created and we needed our first research program to get some fellows in residence. Now residence didn't mean that we had the Wallenberg Center yet, that only came much later. Residence would mean that the residence would be in my department, but we, Johan Rover, myself and Jackie Snoop, who is unfortunately not here, we had to think of a project. And so the problem in biology is that we studied life at various levels. So we, we used to study it like this. So you looked at, you know, seashells and crabs and animals. And what, now we do it this way. We study on the level of molecules, level of organisms, the level of ecosystems. And the snag is that all of these different levels have different languages and different formal theoretical constructs. And we thought, well, isn't it possible for the first TIAS project to get two people together from the lowest level and the highest level, stick them together in an office and see whether they can sort out the problem? So the, this project was called Merging the Layers of Life. And we chose as, a, as the lower level, Hans, that's just because it was a molecular level, not that. So Hans was on the lower level and we had an, an ecologist, Wayne Getz, on the ecosystems level. And actually, we, it worked. So they came up with a very nice integration, and that's a word I'm going to use quite a bit of Hans, um, of, of, this, of this project. But the question is, why did we choose Hans? Now we have to go back in time another 10 years or a little bit more. When I arrived in Dulles Airport in Washington, uh, on my way to a conference in Montana, and Hans would, have, would accompany me. I'd never, never had met Hans before. So he picked me up at the airport. And f f within five minutes in the car, this was science. And he was talking about stuff I'd never heard of before, about hydrogen concentrations that you couldn't measure in the cell because there were a few hydrogens, and you didn't have a normal distribution, you had a Poisson distribution. And my head was spinning, and it kept spinning for the next week or, or so. But what I got from that, that here was one of the most brilliant minds, m brilliant and incisive minds that I'd ever met, but with an added attribute. I, I know many brilliant people, but they don't have this attribute, that of being an integrative systems thinker, being able to stand back, look at the wide picture, and try and see how you can integrate into a deeper understanding of what. So, so Hans was, of course, interested in this. He had done his PhD in Amsterdam, um, and then he came to, the, to Washington to be at the National uh, Health, uh, uh, Institutes of Health where he worked in a lab of, of Terrell Hill for a while as a postdoc, but then he became a, 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 um, a visiting scientist at NIH. And his project was to look at, um, at biological processes, but asking what drives the processes and how fast do they go. So these are two magisteria in physical chemistry that stand there, thermodynamics, kinetics. What Hans was doing was bringing the two together integrating the two into something called biothermokinetics. So actually, a year after that, there was established an international study group for biothermokinetics, of which Hans was a founder member. And if I look at, at what they say on the website, what, what do biothermokineticists do, it perfectly describes what Hans is. He says, what, what we want to do is to obtain a quantitative understanding of the kinetics, thermodynamics, and control of biological processes at the molecular and cellular level. I think that describes exactly what Hans has been doing for decades. So out of this NIH project arose a book that he wrote with Carl van Dam, his PhD supervisor, uh, called uh, uh, Thermodynamics of Thermodynamics and Control of Biological Free and en Free Energy Transduction. The book stands on my, on my, on my uh, shelf. So what happened after that is Hans went back to the Netherlands and he worked at the National um, uh, Cancer Institute for a while, for a few years, and then became the stellar career. So he was first the professor of microbial physiology at the, at the Free University of Amsterdam from 1994 onwards till now. And then he started adding professorships to that. So in 2005 he became professor of, of uh, systems biology at Manchester University 
In 2011, he became professor of synthetic systems biology at the University of Amsterdam. So he carried three professors, joint professorships at the same time. How he did that, nobody knows. But he was shuttling in between UK and Holland. He's now emeritus professor at all three of these. Well, honorary professor in Manchester, but emeritus professor at the other two. So during the four, these four decades, Hans has been really a major force in the international systems biology community. And he served on numerous boards and numerous evaluation panels and committees, making a huge contribution there. Um, also received in the process lots of prestigious prizes and awards. He's a, one of the 40 members of, foreign members of the Italian Ac Ac Academy of Science. I don't know how that happened, Hans, but. <laughs> <laughs> he, so his research record is, is amazing. So he's published more than 450 papers. He's been cited more than 20, 21,000 times. Uh, for scientists, this is <laughs> mind boggling numbers. He, but I think more importantly as well, he's been a, a mentor and supervisor for a host of PhD students, 60 PhD students. Many of them are now leaders in the field of systems biology. Um, he had eight edited books and so on. It's, it's just an, an amazing publication record. So I hope that I, in these few words, have been able to paint the picture of a, of a truly outstanding scientist. But if you were to ask Hans, to describe him. He actually did it in email. He said, this all oh, this is this is unimportant. The most important is, and this is the way Hans describes himself. He says, I am just a, a biochemist from Amsterdam who keeps on trying to understand this complex phenomenon that we call life, and with the help of a lot of my friends. And I think that's the beauty of, of Hans, it's the humble scientist with enormous CV. Hans, we're looking forward to your talk. I know it will be brilliant. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Yanni. I think I should now go home because after this, what can I do? It uh, sounds all so impressive. It's mostly not true. I'm actually just a biochemist from Amsterdam, and that is what counts. And indeed, this uh, presentation comes from uh, actually most, mostly from my friends and uh, a little bit uh, from myself. Uh, uh, and my friends I won't even enumerate because they, I have many, or at least many colleagues, and I, most of the time I can call them friends. Uh, <laughs> Johan, you would hopefully agree, and Janni agrees. So um, you can see that I will want to talk about uh, Beyond Physics and Law after this marvelous introduction by uh, no one less than Professor Janni Hofmeyer, which I much appreciate. Um, now let me move to the next, all right? So, Moveni uh, Nonke, Sani Bona, good afternoon, good middag. Uh, na Nyungi Hans, Mina Nyungi Hans, Ek is Hans, uh, here I am, I'm Hans. Ndia Koliza Kakulu Ukolo, but it's clear, my command of Koza is Izulu Afrikaans nor any of the other seven uh, South African languages is good enough to continue with my multilingualism. Now I must look where Eve is, because this is my apology to Eve. Eve uh, has told me that we have to be multilingual, because no, multilingualism should be the norm, but I have to apologize. I'm not going to address you in Flemish and Dutch at the same time. It's going to be English, uh, even though I agree that multilingualism has a lot of added value. Now, this is actually a picture of uh, Stias, a main part of Stias. Uh, this is the fellows, and uh, Stias is, uh, is here, but also a little bit around the corner, where we have a fantastic lecture room, even nicer than this one, because there's all lazy chairs there, and that's for the fellows. We actually relax when we listen to a seminar, not like you, you have to sit like students in a lecture hall. But these are the fellows, and they come from all over the world, and most, more importantly even, they are excellent in multiple, many disciplines. So, and we, we talk a lot. And one of the things that Stias really designed is a coffee machine. They didn't design the coffee machine, but they decided to only have one. And it's a very slow one. So every day we have a traffic jam in front of the coffee machine, and that makes us talk. 
Then the second trick is we have lunches, and they are long lunches, beautiful lunches. So we also sit together and have a lot of discussions. And then we have the seminars, which are also long, very long, about three hours. I don't know whether you came prepared. And after the seminars, there is going to be discussions of equal times. So that really contributes to a fantastic atmosphere. I felt at least that you, you, know, you get inspired by uh, people working on Norwegian endogenous languages or people working on small economies or people working on, on big data or people working on, fl uh, on Afrikaans and other languages interacting. So I, I, I think I should say my thanks to Stias, Christoph, Edward, Georgina, Goldie, Karen, Leonard, Magdi, Maggie, Nelmarie, and Neuloisio, Lo, Neuloisio, I'm sorry, Neuloisio, for managing the above, and uh, actually Neuloisio for teaching me a bit of cosa, which you have seen was not quite successful, maybe. <laughs> now, I will take you on a journey beyond physics and law, and that means something, because we had talks on physics and law, and beyond physics looks like, hmm, beyond physics, for physicists that's impossible, and beyond law, of course, that looks like, you know, you're not following the law. And actually, I'm going to address that a little bit. But the menu is this, but it's not like a restaurant that you can choose. You're here, you have to listen to it all. So first part is, is our place, our position in the cosmos. Second is uh, certainty in the old days. And then there's going to be uncertainty relations and a little bit of Albert Einstein that you will remember possibly, and then certainty by gathering more information, moving to precision medicine, which is uh, quite interesting for all of us, I think, at the moment, and then order out of uncertainty, the things you don't know, and still, it seems to work. And then there is going to be a little bit about the advantages of uncertainties and diversity. So first, our place in the cosmos, and this was really inspired by a lecture of another fellow of the Institute of Advanced Study, the Stellenbosch Institute of Advanced Study, that's Romeo Dave, who gave us a fabulous lecture about the cosmos and about cosmology. But his, uh, his uh, thrill is science and the idea that one day he would understand it all. Now, I have a slightly different thrill that's also science, but it's life. One day I would like to understand it all. And Yanni already said that, so we're doing biochemistry Imagine this is about small molecules and we still want to understand how life, how you, how I, how you all work on the basis of these molecules. So that's my fascination. Now, Romeo's fascination is cosmology. So he got us into the cosmos, no less, away from Earth to galaxies and then to multiple galaxies, black holes, black, black holes, black energy, I think it's called, and, you know, very far away, and then basically he said, okay, I can simulate this by having interacting particles. I put this into my computers, I suppose, and then I click return, that's what I do with computers, and then it all simulates the universe. So basically this meant he understands everything. Now, I thought maybe he overlooked a detail, and I'm going to get you through this detail. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. We dive into lower spheres, I'm afraid, Romel, but uh, we're going to go back through life, through living systems, to molecules. And if you look at the molecules, that, that is also a challenge, because what I think is we want to, we, we, I went to the humble part of the, commerce, of the cosmos that we also want to understand. Uh, that's a bit egoistic, but it's ourselves. So I want to understand myself, basically. When I teach students, I, I always tell them biochemistry, I told them, well, this is actually an easy subject. You just have to look inside yourself, and that is biochemistry. That's different from what Romeo can do. You cannot look inside yourself and experience the cosmos. But the question then really is, how can these chaotic molecules, because that's what they are, how can they constitute a living, ordered organism? Yeah, it's unbelievable how this can happen, really. And then how can you get health from all this disorder? You would expect havoc, disease all the time, falling apart all the time, rather than order. And that's, older, that's actually an older question from physics, because physics has a, a second law of thermodynamics, which in its primary interpretation means that you always go from order to chaos. And you know this when people die, 
then you'll fall apart into molecules and this becomes chaotic. Whereas biology has, of course, the task of understanding how from chaotic molecules you get to order. And mind you, physics is always true and biology, I guess, always wrong. So what kind of task do we have as biologists, Yanni? What can we do? Now, Yanni helps us, of course, a lot in his uh, theories about causation and um, circular causation. So that helps. Biology is actually, it's of course subject to the laws of physics, but it's subject to additional laws of physics that the physicists never thought about, in a sense. That's one way of expressing it, or at least not in the same type of detail. Now, I talk about error. I will talk about error and about uh, uncertainty, and I really mean that in a loss, loose sense. So it's the uncertainty of prediction. You make a prediction, and it doesn't quite work out. So I got predicted when I went here that there would be winds, Cape winds in Stellenbosch. Well, there were, but there were a bit more than winds. They were more like gales. So you can see that is error. You don't know quite where you are, and uh, so that's the uncertainty. Now, in the old days, there was certainty. And there was certainty, for instance, in physics. And you know this. So Newton taught us that if you have an apple, you pick it from a Stellenbosch orchid, and you keep it like this, and you let go of it, it will drop to the floor vertically, one of the main laws of Newton. So that's a certainty. That would always happen. Uh, now, in biology, uh, you also have certainties. So if you see an egg, and there's a chicken on, sitting on top of the egg, you expect a little baby chicken to come out, right? and not a puppy. Right. So you'd be very surprised. And however, that, that stopped because since 1927, science teaches uncertainty. This is Werner Heisenberg, a, a, a Heidelberg uh, physicist, uh, who figured it out, of course, on the instigation of de Broglie, who figured out that particles are not particles but waves. So a little ball like you use in soccer, it's like a not really a soccer ball, but it should be a rugby ball. So it's not quite round, but it is wider than that, and you don't know precisely what it is. So it's like a wave. If you go to Eiselfontein, then you would find these waves, and you would agree that it's a bit more difficult for a wave than for a ball to determine or to tell you where it precisely is. Is it at the top of the wave or at the bottom of the wave or somewhere in between? And that sort of phenomenon you also have with elementary particles in physics. So that's an uncertainty relationship. There is uncertainty, fundamental uncertainty. And then there seems to be fundamental uncertainty almost in pharmacology and in medicine. So this is a bit hard to read, but you here see numbers. And this is the percentage success rate of these drugs. So we have lots of drugs, for instance, here against migraine. And the success rate is only 20%. Sorry, yeah, I will. Yeah, it's only 20%. And the average success rate is not higher than 30% or 35%. So actually, this means that the average effectiveness of most drugs is 35%. So you're not certain at all when you get a drug in medicine whether it's going to work. And that looks appalling and, and a mistake of the pharmaceutical industry, but it isn't. It is be not because the drug has no effect. Yes, the drug has an effect, but not on all people. So it has an effect on all people. So you would still want the drug to be marketed because if you have the disease, there's at least a chance you get cured, even though the chance is only 35% or, or less. So that's uncertainty in pharmacology. Now there's also uncertainty in law, and this particular example is about Colombia and cocaine, which is uh, transported. I would also talk about ports. So here we have the ports of, of Rotterdam, and then it's transported further, as you know, to the capital of the world, which is Amsterdam, or to Berlin, <laughs> or to Paris. And then we have a minister of, um, uh, a, uh, a secretary, we say in, in US, uh, a minister of, uh, of justice in the Netherlands, and uh, she wants to uh, cope with this. So she wants to get rid of the cocaine trade, and what she wants to do is uh, forbid the import of the cocaine, and then the problem is that if you do that, then you get a so-called market mechanism. She's actually from the Liberal Party, so she likes market mechanisms. So what will happen is that the price goes up, and you get those routes may disappear, but you get alternative routes developing. And of course, that's a problem in law. If you have law enforcement, pathways around it will start to emerge. 
So it's uncertain whether law enforce en enforcement works in many cases. That's the big problem. Now, Jan is already saying yes, of course, because we find the same thing in biochemistry and, and cells. If you block a certain pathway, molecules just go around it or induce pathways around it. Okay, and uh, so that's another example of uncertainty, uh, uh, certainty and law. And Cornelius van der Merwe, whom you may actually know because he's Stellenbosch's, he's from Stellenbosch, but he's also a, a Stias fellow, and he told us about apartments. You know, I never imagined that. If you're in a house, you live together with other families, so these are apartments, and there is big problems how these people coexist. They, sometimes they seem to try to make each other's lives difficult, at least, to say the least. So that's also an uncertainty of apartment law. And then there's uncertainty in anatomy. You know, it seems quite certain. If you look at my hand, that's definitely a hand. And if you would look at my heart, that's definitely a heart, as you saw in the picture. But now, of course, nowadays, we can look at the individual cells of a hand or the individual cells of a heart, and it turns out that they are very different at the level of message RNA. Now, I'll, I have to tell you a bit what message RNA is. It's a very important molecule. You know about the DNA. The DNA is like here. It's the genome consisting of all the DNA. So that has all the information of all the machines in our body, in, in books, so to speak, on library shelves. So it's like a library. But that's useless, and it's made useless because it has to be unchangeable. You don't want to be mess, you don't want anybody to mess with that information. So it's hidden away in a library and special librarians have to go in and get books out or copies of books out, really, into real life, into where you can do something with this. And these librarians are in molecules called messenger, for messenger, RNA. So it's RNA because it's a bit like DNA but not the same. These are the message RNAs. And then the message RNAs, those are the the books, they go to factories that make machines, called ribosomes for the experts. So those are factories, they make machines. And the machines are the proteins that you have in your body, fantastic important molecules with beautiful structures, but more importantly with actions. So every protein is a machine that does something. Like you have wheat flour, and then there's a machine that makes bread. And then you have bread, and you have a machine that wraps it up into bread you buy in the supermarket, and there's a supermarket type of machine, that a, a, a cashier machine, that then allows you to uh, buy that bread. So that's what all the machines do, that's at this level, and then these machines do something, though they, so they can convert flour to bread, and the flour and the bread also have an existence, and those we call metabolites. Small molecules, like sugar molecules, you've heard of those, glucose maybe, before, or sucrose, or, or maybe lactic acid, milk acid, basically. Those are little molecules. So that's how the thing is organized. Life, but it's in a way similar to society as it's organized, or an aspect of society. Now, that was a long story, sorry about that, but it's, uh, it's a take-home story. But I'm going to focus now on, so this is the information flow, I'm going to focus now on this message RNA. I could also talk about the other stuff, but you know, it's good enough to look at this because that carries the magic that I want to talk about. So a good friend of mine, Will Beckman, together with Pernet Verschuren at the University of Amsterdam, um, he, he looked at cells. Now, it's a little bit difficult to see what a cell is here, but the cell is this. The, the blue part is the nucleus. That's where the DNA is. Actually, it's blue because we stained the DNA, but around this you also see a, a, a cell. green circle around it. So here you see green circles coming through this way, and here you also, here, here you don't see so many because there are only two. And that's part of the story, because he then, Will then counted the number of circles you have. Here it's 28, here it's 37, they're all in the nucleus in this case, here it's 17, and here it's two. Now you won't be surprised about this, but I was. I fell off my chair. Because these cells are twin cells, they're sister cells, same parent, they were grown under perf perfectly the same condition. They have the same DNA. They have the same feeding pattern. If you look at them, they also grow exponentially, which means they grow just regulatory. 
regularly. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I should use that, but I can't take. Can I take this off, actually? Oh, here it is. Thank you. Yeah, I, I OK, sorry about that. If you miss half of the two, <laughs> okay, what can we do? OK, but anyway, the important thing is here that these objects are, these, uh, are cells, and they should be identical for all practical purposes. But here, obviously, they're not, because they have differences in numbers of these messages, in number of librarians, so to speak, and the librarians get the information to make the machines, so they probably have different machine, amounts of machines, uh, therefore. And it's not small difference, you see, because you get to, from two to 28, a 14 fold different. And in some cells, not the ones I show here, there could even be zeros. And the zero is going to be important, the fact that we do have zeros. Okay. Um, now, what causes this variability? Uh, why is that? Well, that's a, a law known from physics or from mathematics, statistical mechanics, this is also called. That's because there's just few librarians, and they're cooperative. So the librarians, you know, when it's, uh, say, uh, in, when they're in STIAS, and when it's at 12.30, they all get together and they go for lunch. What happens to the library? Nobody in the library. Right? So you go to a zero all of a sudden, and there may have been three. So every now and then they go back to work, and maybe another crew of librarians come visit, there are six. Yeah? So, so that's why it varies, and that's really an analogy of what actually happens in the cell. So these RNAs, they come together. This is because the DNA has to be red, and sometimes it's open, and when it's open, no proteins around it, many molecules of RNA are made for a while, and then it closes again, and then for a while you have nothing. That's called bursting, statistical variation. Now, um, so the number of, uh, of message molecules varies with time in all these uh, cells, but also in space, that means between different cells, because the cells are not synchronous. They're not timed so that they begin at the same moment. That's not happening, at least not here. Now, Paul is here, hopefully, the visit one of our fellows, and he is interested in synchronicity between cells, and you know that's, that's not happening here, clearly. Now, uh, it so happens that we had Maria Kasper, she's now back in Stockholm, but she gave us a fantastic presentation about message RNA, and this is about, you won't believe it, my hair, uh, but also your hair, actually, and you would think that my hair is pretty dead, not of the uh, ladies, of course, but you know, at my age, the hair seems to be pretty dead, because it's gray. Uh, but it isn't, because if you go to the, to the root of the hair, that's very much alive. And you notice, because every, I hate this actually, every month or so, you have to go to a barber. You know, I hate this, <laughs> they are in your hair, but you have to get it cut. And that means because that your hair is actually growing. So your hair is growing because there's a follicle here, this is at the basis of the hair, where there's lots of cells busy making new hair. They put it on the end and they push it out. Now you see that, why I put this up, this is actually a slide from Maria, but why I put it up is because you can see that there is different functions of the various cells. And she was able to look at these RNA molecules of different types. So this is KRT14, and this is K15, this is MT2, just names of the message RNAs. And then she found for these message RNAs that they all occurred in this cell, the interfollicular basal layer. So that's somewhere I don't even know where it is, but one of them. And, and, and in the outer bulge, yeah, there's other message RNA. So different cell types in this machine together do th something, and that you can recognize them by the RNA. That was her interest. And she talked about this, said, OK, this is clear. This is. I noticed something that if you now look in detail at the different cells, you see that the amounts of message RNA are very, very different. So yes. The cells are different, but within the cell population, these cells have different numbers of RNA molecules as well. So she's also seeing that, even though this is a perfectly operating machine. And this was important for us, for Will Beckman and Pernet Verschuur and myself, because we were interested in, well, we are interested in best cancer. And there's lots of uncertainties. Uh, we know that 50% uh, of humanity is female. One first uncertainty, whether you're male or female. Second uncertainty is that you have 12% chance of developing breast cancer. Then if you have breast cancer, there's 70% chance that 
This has, because you have an estrogen receptor, that's this molecule, this is again the cell, this is the nucleus, that receives a normal message, estradiol, also in the contraceptive pill, that recept, receives this and then goes to the DNA, this is the DNA, and then activates the DNA, and the cell is going to grow. So 70% of, of breast cancers are because this is overly active and the cells are growing too much. So that brought science into, oh here, into treating the 70% with tamoxifen, which binds to the estrogen receptor and inactivates it so that we don't have the proliferation. So that's another uh, 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 uncertainty. And then at, at the end, there is an uncertainty that uh, you, oh yeah, here it is, you have 40%, so 40, it's a fantastic drug this. Don't get me wrong. So this helps, helps for 50%, it's pretty high, but it doesn't help for 40% of the women because they develop uh, resistance to the therapy. That is that something changes here so that this uh, tamoxifen doesn't bind to the estrogen receptor anymore. The important point is that we here have a clear example again of uncertainty. So, okay, there is uncertainty in biology. How can we deal with this? And there is uncertainty in physics, uncertainty in society. Now, physics learned to live with it, believe it or not, and that's through the Heisenberg uncertainty relationships. That is, this is the wave function, but these are the Heisenberg uncertainty relationships. I'm showing this because there's one touch more complex here. It's a combined uncertainty. So you could be certain about the energy, but not at the same time at about the time. So that is, it's more complex than that. But they are accepted by all physicists now, except for one, uh, and that's not the least one. That was Albert Einstein, because he didn't accept that. And he wrote a letter to Max Born, this is his story of science, and uh, he said in the letter, der alte würfelt nicht, God does not throw dice. This is for Christian, also one of the fellows who is interested in, in Bible studies, if I say this correctly, and, and the history of, of religion. Um, now, uh, Einstein said, quantum mechanics is highly impressive. The theory delivers much, but it hardly gets us closer to the secrets of the old man. He does not throw dice. So he didn't believe it, and he maintained it's just that we don't know enough. You know, had we known that this particle, which is where we don't know the position, comes from the left, and we know the time, then we know it could only have been here and not there. So had we had that information, then we would have known this. Now it turns out that when you do experiments, uh, it, Einstein is wrong. There is, uh, things are happening at the same time. There is correlation that is hard to understand for us, but it's wrong. But I'd like to quote Nigel, if you, if you allow me, Nigel, because Nigel was on the Einsteinian side, it seems, but on a different territory. This is about big data. So he was discussing in a seminar uh, standing on the edge of error, and he said that the scientific me method enabled by engineering is powerful and able to deal with error and uncertainty. So that's optimism, and I will show you that it's good optimism. So Einstein was wrong, and this may not be right for elementary particle physics, but it, may be right. it might be right for biology. So we need to test this, we need to have more information about the molecules, about genes, RNAs, proteins, and metabolites. Do we have that? somehow, and for sure we do, uh, and that is this part of my talk, certainty by more information. Um, so in the 21st century, and you're a witness to this, if, as far as I can see, you're all witness to this, yes, uh, there is in the year 2000, the human genome sequence got determined. So that is this library part, all the information, and this cannot be done on everybody in this room. And that's relevant because all our cells have that same information, so it is, it's cheap. You, know, you get value for the buck, so to speak. And then in 2030, this got projected into a metabolic map, which basically told us how it works in one sense. I will tell you more about that in a second. And then in 2020, you got what you, we got what you just saw. We can actually measure all these message RNAs. So that's been very important progress that we can actually measure all the molecules at the level of the DNA and the message RNA, most of the molecules at the level of the protein, and quite a few molecules at the level of the metabolites. But this is progressing, so we will soon be able to uh, know much more. So Dr. Einstein, you could ask, 
Uh, we now have all information. Can we understand disease now? Okay, so I'm going to tell you this story a little bit. Uh, so this is this DNA, which has a slight problem. So we now have that information, except that it's, it's not quite a galaxy, but it is 20,000 genes. For me, 20,000 is quite a bit. Yeah? So, and they are curved up in space, so it's not clear what happens, actually. So how are we going to understand function from nutrition? So we actually managed, uh, and, and this is important to stress that this is a group of groups of scientists that managed. And what, what we did is we looked at this DNA and to little bits of this, and we compared that to DNA of bacteria. And DNA is then homologous. The base sequence is similar in the bacteria. And in the bacteria, we sometimes know what this DNA sequence corresponds to. So whether it actually... Uh, which enzyme it encodes, which protein it encodes, which machine, I should say, it encodes. And then in the bacteria, we know what the machine does. And it works that you then assume that in the human, that machine does the same, if the sequence is the same. We owe this to evolution. Bengt is not here, but, uh, you know, that is one of the other fellows that studies this. Evolution uh, is slow, in a sense, so you can go back. If you see something in a bacterium, this means something for humans. So in that sense, we could find the gene that, uh, that is, is, the, is the motor, is the machine that uh, converts this molecule, maybe A, to a molecule B. And then we could search whether there's a machine that converts this molecule B to a molecule C and search for another machine that encodes going from D to E. So that's how you get a map. You got all the connections between all the molecules. The dots are the small molecules. The lines are the genes. So we have a metabolic metabolic map, and uh, then the story becomes, of course, how do you find function on that map? So what we need to, still need to understand, we now have a map, well, how do we get from nutrition to function? But that's a bit similar to something, a, a problem you had, if you look at the map of Stellenbosch, maybe you, maybe you came from Strand, or Somerset West, and here's your little Volkswagen, and maybe you had to go to Stias, how do you get there? So what you do is you use Google Maps, or or open data for that, and, and uh, we use flux balance analysis as another, but it's a very mathematically corresponding procedure to figure out how do you get to STIAS. So you could do that that way. You could also ask, what is the shortest route? So then you get that way to STIAS. So that's basically the phenomenon. You could imagine, once you have the map, you can use that facility that is already available on Google Maps or in mathematics. So, so that's what we did. So we figured out, if this is the nutrition, how do you get to function? Yeah? And if you have an alternative to nutrition, how could you still get to that function? So we can now understand metabolic function, but how can we understand disease from that? Well, disease is very importantly now not one motor, one engine, one machine that's wrong, but somewhere in the network. There's something wrong, or at multiple places in the network it's wrong. That's really advanced. So previously we used to think it's a single machine. So you would find this machine, the gene, and then you could cure cancer. Yeah? It's not like that. It's something in this network which makes it more difficult. So, so that's the problem then. Now let me discuss then, let me show, tell you what a genetic disease could be. One example of a simple genetic disease, now you should look at this, uh, is that you don't have the gene. You're born and you have a mutated gene. Yeah? So then you don't have this and therefore you don't have that function. So that's just how we can understand this now. And if there's multiple genes, you could also understand that in a similar way. So that's a genetic disease. Then you also have nutritional diseases. Well, that basically means, and I guess you can understand that, that if you don't have this nutrition here, then you can't get to the function either, depending on the nutrition. So we can understand now nutrition disease and genetic disease following this principle, at least. So now I'm going to discuss an example of this. Uh, and that's phenylketonuria, the best known inborn error of metabolism that we use to calibrate our methodology. And this is a disease where if it's left untreated, you have a lack of brain development in the untreated child and a lack of intellectual development. And the therapy is not giving tyrosine, but reducing the phenylalanine in the diet. This is a disease we all got di diagnosed for when after birth, and we got treated if we had it. 
by having a diet which was less in phenylalanine. But now I'm going to see whether we can understand that disease now on the basis of this. Can we understand uh, with certainty how this disease works? And, and the cause of the disease, or many of the cases of disease, is the deletion of one single gene. That's a phenylalanine to tyrosine converting uh, machine. That's called PAH, phenylalanine hydroxylase. So PAH is going to be the stuff we're looking at. And now it's going to be tough for a few minutes because now you're going to be on the flight deck of systems biology and you're going to see what we then need to study. Well, my PhD students, postdocs, and myself and try to understand. So you get something like this. This is a metabolic map like you saw before. So there's many more lines, but you don't see the lines because we only plot the lines where there is actually activity. So you see here there's activity, and this would then mean that phenylalanine is taken up from the intestines. So that's a flux of phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is one of the amino acids. It's one of the components of proteins. So that's phenylalanine. You see there's another line that goes here, but it also go in the liver to tyrosine. And then the tyrosine goes out of the liver, and we go to a different compartment with the map through the blood into the brain, and then you see ultimately into biomass. And the phenylalanine does this, and the tyrosine does this as well. And then you see that biomass is made. This is a technical term for growth. So you get more brain. So the infant would grow its brain. And here it's growth of liver. And you also see interesting compounds. That is dopamine, that's here, and uh, serotonin, that's there. Uh, so let me go back. So there's phenylalanine influx into liver. So that's this flight deck situation of a map where it's hard to understand. But if you then focus, you see, okay, yeah, there's phenylalanine influx in the liver. And then you see there's flux through phenylalanine hydroxylase, this enzyme that's deleted in the patient, that's absent in the patient. And there is growth of the brain, biomass synthesis in the brain. There's a number here that's not zero. And there is dopamine synthesis, which is nice. Dopamine is the, is the molecule that rewards you if you've done effort. Uh, so that's good. And then, let me press here, there's serotonin synthesis in the brain. That's a feel-good hormone, serotonin. So it now looks that this is quite okay. So we have brain development. If you don't have the mutation, we feel good and we have reward. And that's, of course, important for intellectual development. You do something, you try to learn uh, mathematics, one plus one is two and two plus two is four, and then you f have a reward idea. Oh, I can do it. Yeah, that's biochemistry, basically. That is this molecule. So now the disease. We knock out this PAH. So we knock out that PAH, and that's what's going to be seen here. This is the same picture as you saw before. So we knock out this enzyme here, the axis. You see that this flux disappears. There's no yellow line here. There's only little flux left here, little function left here. And you see that the biomass here has decreased from 0.110 to 0.09. So that has decreased, less brain growth. But to our, well, surprise enlightenment really, there was completely abolished dopamine synthesis. So it turned out from our work then that yes, we could understand that the brain developed less, but an important component was the absence of this reward molecule, dopamine. And uh, so that was, uh, what we saw was reduced brain growth, not reduced liver growth, so it's actually here, liver growth is the same, and we have abolished dopamine synthesis. So that corresponded precisely to what, to what the disease does. Now, can we understand therapy, phenylalanine restriction? And that's what we do here, phenylalanine restriction. So you got much less flux here than there. This is 0.04 and this is 0.200. You got much less flux here. Now, mind you, the paradox. We have less input. Now, the question is, can we get more output? That's a paradox. But yes, we get. This goes up to 1.0. One zero zero. This goes up from what it was zero back up to 0 0.016. So yes, it works. We have less input, more output, uh, and that works. It's precisely what we should see. Brain growth is restored and dopamine synthesis is restored. So yes, we can precisely understand this. Now, now this was my example. I apologies for, for how detailed this became. But it is an, an example where we understand the disease of an individual, because most of us don't have this. Only some people have this. And 
For us, the idea is now we can do this for all the genetic diseases, uh, or not our idea, but you know, we have done it, and other group, when I say we, it's collective we, many research groups. Uh, so we can understand an individual's disease. Actually, remarkably, it's a genetic disease, but we can cure it by diet. This is fantastic. And then the therapy works not for 30%, but now for 100%, because we're now specifically targeting the patient of this disease. And it's an illustration, of course, where uncertainty has been removed by full information. So Nigel, Albert, you're right. You, know, you could have more information, understand things better. So that's the scheme, the flow scheme of this. And soon, hopefully, this will be enforced by or reinforced uh, by intelligent AI. Because mind you, if we could just get the data, ultimately, on 8 billion experiments that run on this planet, that means 8 billion people that run in this planet, if we can get their DNA sequence and we get their health pattern, then we can get a lot further than this. So that's an outlook. This is a traffic analogy, obviously. If there is a roadblock somewhere, like a tree fallen, you can now figure out by coming from a different direction, uh, maybe the N2 instead of the N1, uh, uh, and then you can still get to see us. So now let me discuss order out of uncertainty, because we now understand how we, can, how we may deal with medical uncertainty, but how does biology deal with that? And, uh, and that is basically this question that I posed at the beginning. Physics would tell us you move from here to here. How the heck can we move from chaos to order? And we're trying to understand that. And this is now a diagram that I made for you to tell you about this. So we eat sugar, say. And there is this machine that converts this to sugar, P, which is another molecule. And the sugar, P, is converted by yet another machine to milk. And that Another, yet another machine, the yellow machine, converts it to amino acids. And the red machine converts it to what I call irreverently biomass, new cells. OK, so this is a nice scheme, but it has something in it where Janni Hofmeier talked a lot about. It has circular causality in it. This is a self-perpetrating museum. So these are the reactions. They are carried out by the proteins, but the proteins make themselves. They make themselves. So this is a runaway system. If you make a bit of protein, if you make a bit more, you make more of the proteins. So if this becomes more active, you make more of these proteins. And these proteins are also here, so they make more of themselves. So you get a positive feedback loop. Self-organization is called, potentially, that keeps life. If you start it, then it becomes a lot more. Um, so that is because these proteins are connected like that. Now, what's also happening, of course, that these proteins are damaged. So we live in a world where there's cosmic radiation and chemistry going on. So there's damage to the proteins that they need to grow. But therefore, you need to restore them. And now you need the librarians again that get you the information. Those are the message RNAs. So we thought, OK, it's perfect. We have these cells. And we looked at the population of cells in an experiment. And then we said, well, it's going to be clear. All the cells have all, this, have all this stuff. They have all the machines, all the proteins, because at every moment in time, they have to repair themselves. And therefore, they will all also at all moments in time have this information. So that was our expectation. So as you know, in science, we have ideas. Then we, fo we formulate a hypothesis. We think it might be like this in a testable way. And this was testable thanks to the techniques that also Maria Kasper uses and, and Will Beckman uses. We can look at the individual medicines, the RNAs in the cells. This is really sensational for me. Every individual cell, you can measure the message RNAs, the librarians. So the idea is that all cells would have this. You know, it was not only the idea. I was certain about this, but not at all. You see, what we found that of 800 cells in the population, we just got tired, so we didn't do 801 anymore. None of them had all the RNAs. So none of them could rebuild themselves upon damage, and for sure they were damaged. So how was this possible? This is a growing cell population, healthy in all respects, and they could not repair themselves. So that is the story. No cell has the message RNA. Imagine no library in South Africa has librarians carrying the complete information to restore things in South Africa. And then South Africa would slowly decay and not be functional anymore. 
So that would be kind of a disaster. Yet you see that South Africa is, is moving, yeah? it's going, moving on, and the cells are maintaining themselves. So how is this possible? Well, then we thought about this. Well, and then we said, well, maybe suppose all cells would have all message RNAs all the time. They would be making protein all the time. And maybe that would be too much. You could get too much proteins. And um, so therefore, it might be useful to have less RNA. And then there's two options. You have less RNA of all the RNAs at the same time, or you come in pulses. The first 10 minutes of the day, you make one message RNA for one machine. And the next uh, 20 minutes, you make message RNA for the second machine. And the next 50 minutes, you make message RNA for the third machine. That would be another option, at least. And then we thought whether that might be going on. So uh, how, uh, and that would be a way to understand this then. So if always much message RNA, there would be too much protein but maybe that would be more distributed. So that means that the situation is that uh, if you look at one individual type of message RNA, one machine, then the first uh, periods it, it would be made and then for a while it would not be synthesized and then for a while it would not be synthesized, then it would be synthesized, then it would not be synthesized and then again synthesized. And because RNA is unstable, you get pulses. It's being made and then it decays. It's being made and then it decays. Now, this message RNA, as you can see, is translated into protein. This green stuff is the protein that corresponds to this, the machine. But the machines are stable, much more stable than the RNA. So they're made and then they go down only slowly. And then they're made and they go down only slowly. And that has the effect that on average there's going to be machine and on average there's going to be no or very little message RNA. And that's what we see. We see in most cells, no message RNA, but we see proteins in all the cells. So that is the solution to this, this point. So you have uncertainty in the sense of looking at the cells, they don't have message all the time. So you think, okay, this is very uncertain, but because of time averaging, to be technical, if you wait a long time over the entire day, then of course they will over the entire day have message and therefore make protein. Okay, now, this gets me to the advantage of diversity and uncertainty. And that has, of course, to do with a couple of things, like integration of incompatible functions. That's why it may happen. And actually, the one message RNA may degrade the other message RNA, or at least compete for protein synthesis. And it would have this advantage that every cell does what it is best at. And it is, has the advantage of clear mutual benefit. And that's what you can see in our body, of course. You see the different organs which are in principle incompatible. So a liver does the chemistry, where's the liver? Liver does the chemistry. But you couldn't really do chemistry very well if you're doing this all the time, which is what the heart does. Or if you do what the lungs do, like this, it's not the same as what the heart does. And it's in fact incompatible. So you can do this when you have this diversity. But of course it's important, and you can see this in this body, that they should collabor or collaborate and be rewarded at the same time. So what happens here is the, the liver produces, no, the intestines, where's the intestine? Uh, produces glucose and sends this to the blood and the blood distributes this to all organs. So all organs are rewarded for their participation in the system. They all get their part of the glucose. That's the principle and that's what Johan C. van Wijk, one of the other fellows, also taught us in her lecture, diversity diversification should be, should be there, but also fair. Not only there, but also fair. And Rolf Seppold, he looked at ecology, and he, he told us that in, through the history of humanity, we have, we have benefited a lot from biodiversity, the fact that there's many organisms around us. And then Ian Golden, he looked at the economy, and he, he showed us very significant remarks for the Netherlands and for Germany at the moment, you know, immigrants, have really helped society a lot by in importing lots of capabilities and, and new ideas. So that's diversification in functions, which you also see in Stellenbosch, of course. It, these, these are the examples where if you would imagine that I would be a taxi driver and a university professor at the same time, you may not want to join the taxi. It would not be safe. So 
you know, this, specific, this, this specialization is important. And there's also another specialization. That one part of Stellenbosch is not the same as another. So you should, you should find solutions that are specific for the location. And, uh, and I think Faith has, uh, has explained this very beautifully in terms of pollution. And we have our own, ourselves, a study in Bangladesh where you also see this. This is arsenic toxicity in drinking water. And it requires individual solution. Now, this also applies to university teaching. I'm a university professor, so half of my heart is in teaching, half of my heart is in research. So that also applies to teaching, a new teaching method, which I try out in uh, Stellenbosch, which it, because it's a bit safer. And uh, we have a transdisciplinary course on how to design an alien. And there we have students from biology, psychology, physics, and chemistry. Now, usually you would then train the students to become all the same. They all understand the same interdisciplinary stuff. We don't do that. We train them what, in what I call a transdisciplinary ver version. So the physicist is trained in physics, the chemist in chemist, but they have to do a project together. So they have to be ex able to ask, the physicist has to be able to ask the biologist a question and then understand both the question, which is hard, and the answer, and then use it in the collaborative project. Yeah, so that's the idea of transdisciplinary teaching. And that's really something I think is important now. The problem is there's too much to learn at the moment. So we can only specialize, but then we have to solve problems together, and that's trans transdisciplinary. And then in politics, of course, we, I, these examples are clear. There's no one-fits-all solution. So when Trump says he knows it all, don't believe him. Well, I'm sure you don't. But, you know, that also holds for other people. We don't want strong people. We don't want leaders. We want clever people talking with each other, solving problems together. Right? Uh, and uh, Klaus Beiter is one of the fantastic fellows. He, he also told us that policymakers benefit most from free academic behavior. So if you're a politician, you would not want to believe that. You would tell a scientist, well, please sort this out for you and give me an answer. No, you wouldn't say give me an answer. Give me this answer as a politician. That's not how it should be done. Academic people should be free and should be able to come up with different answer. Only then as a politician, you really know more when you ask them something. And how to best manage people, you probably know this. Uh, that's this answer, you don't. <laughs> uh, and, and the deeper meaning of this is that you should make them like biology. Self-organize them, get their own interest in a part of the problem and then to collaborate. That is how to do it. And uh, that is, of course, uh, also happening fantastically at STIOS, for which I can only thank uh, Christoph, Edward, Georgina, Goldie, Karen, Leonard, Magdi, Mag Maggi. Nel Marie and Noe Loiso for not managing us too much. <laughs> so the take home messages are that biology and medicine are not certain, they're full of uncertainties. But if you make, become more specific into the individual cases, they be become much more, if not completely certain. So that talks to individualized medicine. We are removing now everybody his or her own therapy. If you have type 2 diabetes, you should not just be treat, treated by metformin, but you should be treated by drugs that are specific for you. That's the future. And um, we've seen the diversity, how useful that is, but I think that also applies to society. That diversity and uncertainty, therefore, another aspect of it, is Important, if you meet a person in the street, you're not going to know what his profession is, his or her profession is. Uh, and this should be thrived upon by individualized management and teaching. So that's a task for universities. I, I, I'm afraid, you know, you know this all already. So I've been probably been bringing water to the sea. You know this because you're in South Africa and you have this background of diversity and you're building a fantastic country, which I really love, with challenges, with difficulties. It's all understood. But you're doing, a, you, if you're South African, you're doing it a lot better than we in Europe, where it is an absolute mess. So you're doing this. This is actually a nice, uh, in Aunt Sophie, you could see this nice uh, tapestry, which also uh, uh, explains the role of diversity a lot. So I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And uh, this is where I stop. And now it's uh, open to Chris.
Thank you, Hans. That was fantastic. And Yanni promised integration, so you've even integrated the, the cohort of fellows. In fact, I think we'll ask you to update your, your presentation at the end of the semester when everyone's had a chance to, to present. So, and, uh, and also just the fascination of witnessing through your career the advances in your field. I think that's, that's been really, really wonderful to, to learn about. So, we have time for questions. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was about... <laughs> I was, I was about to share with the guest here that usually at the end of the uh, the, the lecture, Yanni's, uh, Hans's hand is is up first, so so someone will have to be Hans and ask the first question. Let's go with Chris. I, I'm not sure I could ever quite be a Hans, but I'll I'll do my best. So so you you say up there the end is just a new beginning. And um, arguably one of the biggest uncertainties is how things may evolve in the future. Could you, could you comment on whether in your view it will become possible to predict evolutionary trajectories, perhaps even at the very small scale, thinking of flu virus evolution and how feasible that is and so on? So, so a great question. Can I think of ways of predicting where evolution will bring us? That's how I understand the question. And if you talk about the human, that's one different matter. Um, but if you talk about non-human, like viruses or bacteria, yes, we can. Uh, we have tr been trying to do this for tumor cells. That's sort of a microevolution in a host body. And then you have this point of different mutations and selection for non-responsiveness. So yes, it's possible. It's not going, at the moment not good enough. So you would say immediately, you know, this is not very impressive, but in principle, this is possible. And, and the fascination is, of course, that you have all these functions, so these metabolic pathways, and there could be mutations at any spot. So what you would do in a big computer, you would m make these mutations at random, and you would run a million models, mathematical models of this, all with a different mutation. And then you would ask, you would give them a certain nutrition, you would ask about their growth rate, and then you would find that the one cell, the one mutation grows better than the other, and that mutation would be fixed. This is actually being done, has been done already by colleagues of mine, uh, so that seems to work. Doesn't mean it's right yet, because it's more complicated than this. In practice, mutations come together. They're not single, but they're more like pathways, mutations, so you would need that. So it's more difficult than that, but I think that's, in principle, therefore, it is possible. Um, now, the, the, the problem may be, a problem may be that there's too many solutions to find. So evolution has also this possibility of uncertainty, no, this also aspect of uncertainty in the sense that certain mutations happen at a certain time scale and others don't. And you can't predict that. So your model would also have to be a bit stochastic. There's a probability of this evolving, a certain probability, but you're not going to be sure of this. So you get sort of a, a, a probabilistic, a Bayesian probabilistic, possibly, answer, I think. You, however, know this, knows this better than I do, and uh, Chris is only going to talk to us a couple of weeks from now, so uh, then we'll have the definitive answer. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Beautiful. Thanks. Uh, Nigel, and, and then uh, Romil. Yeah, thanks very much, Hans, and um, great talk. I, I, I guess uh, just a general reflection. So um, one of the great insights from the pandemic was that despite all the best efforts of epidemiologists and people working in, uh, in therapies that might or might not work, the great missing piece in all of that was actually behavioral science. So it's an interesting fact that all the non-pharmacological interventions, people just didn't know some of the basic facts about contact matrices, who met who, you know, uh, uh, what did social structure or social status mean about who met who? And, you know, I suppose it's a, it's a wild question in a way, but I, I guess I wonder, in an analysis of life, the sort you're giving, do you think that psychological science actually will end up having a role? That is to say that these organisms ultimately, certainly we, have preferences which we manifest, sometimes associative mating, who we might prefer to be with, who knows? Do those sorts of considerations actually come into your characterization 
with all of their profound uncertainties. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that's a great question, whether psychological effects would come into consideration, for instance, in the pandemics. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about a story about this, that, that yes, they do, and yes, they don't. So first of all, they didn't. So I, uh, like many others, made fantastic simulations of, uh, of how the pandemic would evolve and what the government should do about it. And uh, that was quite clear. Uh, there were also other mathematicians that did this, and it was clear, you know, hard at the beginning, just shut everything down like the Chinese did, and it worked in China. And the uh, European governments, because it's democratic, uh, didn't, were not up to this. They had a priority of being voted in again. So that was that, but that was clear, but it wasn't. Because what I didn't look at as a scientist was at all the sociological effects that people would just refuse to get vaccinated and, you know, uh, they would sit together where it was forbidden and things like that, which are all legitimate things, but I just, as a scientist, as a nerd, was not taking that into account. But now we could. So we could have learned from this, and as you say, there could be sociological aspect, sociolo sociological and psychological aspect could be taken into account. Now, the other side of the story is that even though we, we test all this stuff on bacteria often, I recognize in bacteria psychology, and you might be amused by this, but you know, psych bacteria, they get lots of signals in, and then there is a network we hardly understand, and they come to what I call decisions. They open up for certain molecules and close for other molecules, so that is sort of a psychological effect. And that sort of thing we can model, uh, we can understand, therefore, and we can do experiments about. So we can train bacterial cells, we've done that in the lab, we can give them certain things, and then the, after that they change, they anticipate then if for a while you don't give them the same food, they will anticipate that they will get that same food again, which is, I think, sort of a, maybe it's primitive, but it's sort of a psychological effect, as if there is a mind with a memory and anticipation. So that, hence, I think I have some optimism that all of this can be added, uh, ultimately. Now, the third part of that is, and it's a little bit in, like my response to Chris, there is a stochastic Thing. There is just individual strange phenomena happening. You know, a prime minister uh, having a foolish idea like happened in the Netherlands, or, you know, uh, a, 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 another person dying all of a sudden of, of, of influential status. Yeah, that will always be an uncertainty. And, and I, you know, that's not something I, uh, I find easy to deal with. So you then get these probabilities. One way of, of dealing with this, which we have done, is running again millions of models in parallel and then see what sort of, what could happen. And then you get the stochastic picture. But it's uh, very interesting, you know. In, in a way, the pandemic, we learned a lot from the pandemic, or at least we, science learned a lot from the pandemics, and other people also learned a lot from the pandemic. There's a few that didn't, usually the politicians, they didn't, because they're too busy with other things. Yeah, Hans. Uh, yeah, that was that was a, a really interesting. You, you gave this example of this uh, this precision medicine, sort of targeting this one particular disease, and that seems like a bit of a, a holy grail for medicine, right? To be able to do that for for all kinds of diseases. So, I guess my question about this is: is is this now, you know, given that we can map the DNA of every individual and all these sorts of things, is this now just a matter of engineering? Uh, or, or is it? Is there still science? It, 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 can, if we had enough money and the biggest AI and all the machines, could we just solve this? Or do we think, is there still something we don't know? There is, there is uh, things we don't know. So at the RNA level, we can do this in principle. At the DNA level, it's easy because the DNA is, every, is the same for all the cells. But I also, as you know, we have different organs. And for the RNA, we can do this. We can get a little bit of a sample from the blood, from the skin. Uh, but not from the heart or from the liver. You wouldn't like that if you take a liver function and then you get the RNA out. It's possible, but it's not nice enough to get done by everybody. And certain organs, like the heart, is impossible. Uh, so that's a major limitation. Now people are working on finding other optical methods to look into heart cells or liver cells to find that information. So a lot more science progress is needed 
both in the, in the measurement methods, which may be semi-engineering, but it's still also science behind that. And then in, in the interpretation, because often the measurements give indirect images of the molecules. You don't get precisely sugar. You get a gamish of sugar and amino acid at the same time. Then you have to interpret this. So there's still a lot to be done there, yeah, in the genomics, in the functional genomics uh, area. Yeah. So maybe you're a candidate. You want to switch from physics to biology. We got, could be, we would be very welcome. <laughs> Uh, thank you, first of all, for the dopamine uh, and uh, the learning effect I had, uh, the reward from, from your talk. Okay, yes. But you know me a little bit. My learning strategy is resistance. So in some way, I heard various concepts of uncertainty in your talk. And there's the one that excludes predictability. That was the main point, if I got it correctly. But you also brought in the uncertainty of not yet knowing, and the promise that we once, at, as Romel said, once will know everything if we put things together. But is there, isn't there a fundamental difference between this uh, unpredictability, the uncertainty on the one hand, and that what we do not know yet, and how we put things together that we do know them afterwards, somewhat. So can you tell the different usages of uncertainty in your talk a bit apart? Yeah, so, so there, thank you, Christian. Uh, so th there's two types of uncertainties. Uh, so one is you predict something and it may not quite work, but there's also on the input side, in the information you get in, there's an uncertainty and that also has its effect. Is that it? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, well, can I say something about this? Yeah. So you know, I'm, I'm, in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm too optimistic on the input side, for instance, because are you going to know what an individual patient has eaten and done through his life, his or her life? And you might need that. So can we actually ask of people that every day they're going to write down what they did? Well, you, first of all, you have privacy problems, but second, people are not going to do that. You know, who's going to do that? So there is going to a limit, a, a limit in the sense of getting rid of that uncertainty, certainly. Now, I've been, we've been trying to deal with that, uh, but as an incomplete solution, by then allowing uncertainties in input and in output. And I call this the rubber band or elastic band method. So we have then various, I already said that, millions of models, and in those, those, those cases, billions of models, running in parallel, where we have all possibilities that we're not sure about. So we're not sure whether you ate steak yesterday or spinach. So we're going to put in steak and another model, spinach. We just don't know. So we run this in parallel, and we do the prediction in this. And then we hope we get, for certain, and that happens for certain things, the same prediction of whether this drug will help for your diabetes if you would have that. But in other cases, maybe not. And that would be a remaining uncertainty. That would still, however, point us to the fact that we could then, there's something in the difference between eating spinach and, and, and the steak. So that, that could be a way towards progress. But you're right, you know, remove complete uncertainty uh, is, is not realistic. And it's on both sides. It's on the input, but also on the prediction side. Also on the prediction side, we have, because these, these systems are complex, you have non-determinism. Non so sometimes you cannot even predict it because you don't have enough, accurate enough information. That in biology, the last part, I don't find very often because biology tends to work towards order. Selection, evolutionary selection has selected for order, but remains to be seen. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. So we had the person with the green jersey next, then Klaus, then Natasha, then Louis, and then Gia. So let's, uh, let's see if we can get through those. OK, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, I'm not a biology student, but I, I've read some about how environmental factors and like stress and stuff can change gene expression. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not very sure about the details of the chemistry behind it or epigenetics, but I just wanted to hear if how, how that works in your model and how much uncertainty 
environmental factors bring to it? <coughs> so so the, the question is, uh, there's environmental influences on biology, and how does that work? Because on gene expression. On gene expression, yeah. On, on biology through gene expression, yeah. So, uh, good, good point. And I didn't explain that really, because I had the DNA immutable in a library, and there were these librarians that taking out the messages. But the librarians are not, they need to be instructed. So they are instructed by conditions, like somewhere in the cell something happens, and that binds to a librarian, would say technically, or the librarian sees this, and then goes to a certain part of the DNA to get the information out of there. And that is done by the molecules inside our cells, and that keeps it well regulated. That, of course, has been evolutionarily selected for stability and goodness, if you want. But also there's environmental influences, which may be good, normal, but sometimes bad, xenobiotic, molecules that the body has never seen, not even in evolution, like uh, CFOS and things like that. So there they come in, well, I should say, for instance, at the level of the librarians. They can also directly interfere with the machines. And, you know, we look at arsenic pollution and you find both. Um, but interfering with the machines, paradoxically, is not as bad as interfering with the librarians because we have many machines of the same type. If one fails, we have many others. If the librarian fails, that has a consequence for many more machines being built. So there is subtlety in that, uh, but uh, that's how it works. Uh, it's not that we all understand it, of course, because these molecules, we don't e sometimes we don't even know how they affect. And there's another problem that sometimes they, they work at very, very low concentrations. And that makes it hard to do the experiment in a laboratory in a well-controlled fashion. Because then there's a low concentration that binds to everything, so you don't know the concentration, actually. So, yeah, so, good point. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Klaus was next. So you devised a picture for us of um, how things occur at the microbiological level, that um, there is a principle of uncertainty, but uh, to a certain extent, or to a great extent, uh, there is also predictability. Now the question is, can these rules also be applied to social organization? So, so let's take the example of, of a university. So historically, universities have developed in a certain way. There's a certain form of the way they organize themselves. Is this the same kind of principles that actually apply at the microbiological level? Um, uh, so is it the same rules, or is it rules applied by way of analogy? And can we learn something from the way we should structure things in society? So for example, take the case of the state interfering in universities more and more. So is this kind of um, occurring against some natural rules, laws of nature that actually apply? Yeah, uh, so, um, uh, so, so the question is uh, the analogy between, uh, say, society or sociology uh, or, or university politics and mo the molecular world inside cells. Is that, that a precise, is it the same? No, it isn't. So the actors are different. Do they act in, in the same ways? No, but they act in similar ways. So we can project the one onto the other. Uh, I, I am very much in favor of this similarity because what I see in sociology, uh, you, you really can't, or people really can't do experiments very much. It's difficult to do a sociological experiment, a well-controlled experiment. Whereas we could build an analogy in a mathematical space, but also in an experimental molecular biological space in a cell that would be similar to sociology, and you could do an experiment. So that is why I like that analogy. The question is whether it's the same. No, there are vast differences. One difference is that the molecule numbers, the number of people, the number of rectors that the university has is only one. And it's not many like that. So you can't use the physical chemical thermodynamic average rule that makes it more predictable. So it's going to be more stochastic depending on the mood of the rector, something will happen today or, or, or not. 
right, in principle. Now, this is, this is controlled at universities because there's committees around rectors and everything. So we have found in humanity a way to deal with this. But in that sense, the stochasticity is more different. And also the memory effects are going to be different. So, so a certain uh, chair of a committee has a certain background, uh, doesn't like a certain committee member, that sort of thing exists less in the molecular world, although we can construct it. So it is difficult, it's different, but uh, I think we could go further than we are now in making the analogies work, definitely. Yeah. And some of the things, you know, the other side of this is that some of the things you see happening in sociology or political science are so absurd that we easily can say from the molecular world that this is absurd. Yeah. <laughs> so this point of thinking we need a strong leader is you know, completely ridiculous. Good. We'll take that. Thanks. Natasha, next. Thanks so much. Um, I think I'm... Thanks, Hans, for your talk. I think I'm following along with what Christian said, which has come to be the common way that we ask questions, <laughs> um, which is to ask um, several things about teleology. So there is very much here an assumption that um, unpredictability and predictability um, are presented to us like predictability is the one where we're making progress, right? And while we're talking about uncertainty, what seems to be laid out is a very kind of linear teleology of the more we move through time, the better we know um, in terms of making progress. But we know that um, History has also shown us with things like eugenics or things like the social grant system and the technologies involved in it that um, over time does not necessarily mean progress. So I wanted to ask you um, the ways that kind of thinking about that comes into the work um, where it's not sometimes, you know, you're not making progress and you might be heading down um, a route but even though it might be the cutting edge of science, is not necessarily perhaps what's um, needed also by people living with, um, with disabilities or with particular issues. And so on that point, at what stage does one kind of think about the ways we're also kind of laying out what, it, what a disability is and what what values we're attaching to particular things. So rather than trying to make people blind see, um, are we spending the time kind of thinking about a society that understands that people move through it in different ways, etc.? cetera? Um, I'm particularly thinking of Neuralink and Elon Musk here, sorry to even bring that name into the room. Um, but where, you know, a lot of the paralyzed patients who's trying to make walk again, say actually what we want research to be done into is about certain kinds of pain, certain kinds of bowel movement. We don't, many of us don't want to walk again because that's not like our failure. So yeah, I guess it's lots of questions about time. Yeah, lots of questions, lots of answers about uncertainty and whether we always, so one question was, will we always move forward and not sometimes backward? in science or in biology. And for sure, when we look at these systems or our understanding of them, we can understand that disease develops also. We can also do the inverse of the optimistic note that I put here, how if you have a certain set of mistakes where you take the wrong, wrong nutrition in combination with a certain mutation, the body gets worse and worse and worse. So there's also negative developments that we can model and we can understand. So that's one thing. There's also, in terms of science, the development of science, of course, we've witnessed uh, the fact that sometimes we think, I could be one of them, that you, know, you make a hypothesis and then you try to test it and you do a lot of work to test it and to find it and so on. And you know, uh, 20 years later, it turns out you were just plain wrong. It's completely different. You know, that, that happens as well. But of course, there we have the experimental test in, in this field, which is much harder in other fields, that will tell us. And these experiments can take a while, but okay, they, they will tell us. So we can look at the epidemiology of disease, and then we know, where, and, and, and therapies, and we, need, and we know then whether it will work, the clinical trials, etc. So that, that, that will deal with that aspect. 
Um, now the the fact, yeah, there's another interesting part. Um, yeah, so there is a, a disease called uh, fatigue. If I look in the room, then some of you will have this chronic fatigue because, <laughs> well, that's not what I meant, but you show, you seem to show it. But you know, this is a serious matter that there is a fair percentage after COVID where people have chronic fatigue, which is, uh, and you know, there you find that things that are for scientists, for me, were hard to understand in the beginning. Yeah, I would think, okay, let's cure it. But that's not the main issue. The main issue is often recognition of the disease and the fact that, okay, I have the disease, how do I now live with this? So you have to do the sociology and the psychology, and I, as a biochemist, cannot in first instance help. Yeah, I can only do this little bit of curing it, and this may take a lot longer. So yes, I can only apologize that we cannot do this or we don't move fast enough in those areas. Uh, and by, you know, by things like Stia's talking with people, you may get better ideas to do some things together. Yeah. Thanks, Natasha. We had Louis next. So thank you, first of all, for your presentation. After seeing your PowerPoint, I realized why my students think that my PowerPoints are quite boring. So I, I've, I've learned a bit from you here. Uh, you focus on life and you study life and I'm also fascinated with that and speaking with Yanni about all these things, it's, a, it's really a, just a fascinating field that you are working in, but I would like to ask about death. Um, first, on a lighter note, if you succeed with what you are doing, I don't want to be one of your specimens because I don't think my, my pension will last forever if I don't die. And some of the politicians in the world, we don't hope that they will never die. I mean, some of them uh, are terminally ill for 20 years already in our own context. But on a more serious note, uh, death, as I see it, is sort of a vital element of life on this planet. Um, so where does death f fit into all of this? Um, are you also sort of planning for death. There was somebody uh, in a previous cohort working here on programmed uh, death, um, that we are biologically in a certain sense also programmed for that. Where does that, this fit into your model? Yeah, so, so it, it, it didn't come into my talk, but uh, there's of course a substantial amount of work uh, working on the fact that cells commit suicide. This is called apoptosis. So this is programmed cell death, and you, you can see this in your fingers because this used to be one tissue, and the cells in between have been eliminated by just making them die, or they do this themselves uh, by looking at the signal. So we also look at this uh, and, and try to understand this a bit more. And, and aging, so if I first go to aging, what is aging now? You see this accumulative failure, whereas first of all, you don't notice anything, and then all of a sudden, when you're about 90, then it all precipitates at the moment. Um, and that is because of an effect of networks, probably. So, you know, if you have five parallel routes, if you miss one, it's okay. If you miss two, it's not quite okay. If you miss four, then it becomes serious. So that's a lot like a precipitation, looking at it from your side. So that's my way of understanding aging and therefore death, because the fifth one in that four is then giving rise to death. Um, but obviously, we, you know, but some people don't like this, but I, I, I was on public television in, in the Netherlands saying that you know, within 40 years, we would all become 120 rather than 80. And then you get people that don't want that or people that want that. But of course, the implication is that we will not only move the time that you die, but also the time that you're healthy. And I'm afraid also the time that you can begin to enjoy your pension. So in the future, you will have to work till 100 rather than, what is it, 65. And, but then you'll die at 130. So then it's not so bad if we can do this. And this is what it looks like. Now, there's some other stuff that maybe says because of this accumulation of errors in, over time, we may not quite understand where this is. So I think it's in the network, but it could also mean certain molecules, like the end of the DNA is one theory, or the mitochondria, which are the energy powerhouses of the cell. So I may be wrong in that philosophy. Uh, we'll have to see. But you know, optimism says that ultimately we'll figure that out. Somebody will figure it out, hopefully us, but <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Louis. And um, we had uh, Gia. 
Thank you so much for your brilliant talk. Uh, so I want to come back to uncertainty because that's the central core of your presentation. And there was one type of uncertainty that I didn't hear you express explicitly at least. Maybe you put it into implicitly into something else. I mean, we, you talked about fundamental uncertainty um, and, uh, and then lack of information and how you would... Uh, a certain uh, degree of randomness, stochasticity, whether that's fundamental or lack of information, and how you could deal with that by doing Monte Carlo simulations, just lots with different input. But, but you could have exactly the same input and have lots of uncertainty in your understanding, the models you put that into. So the presentation, representation of processes, so the understanding of processes. So I didn't really, so we call that from model uncertainty as um, opposed to data uncertainty. So I didn't hear you talk much about model uncertainty because the, for that you could put all the exactly same input and, uh, and um, the same uh, 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 representation of the system, but still the function would be different. So how about that in biology? So, so if I get it right, the, the question is that, that when you do this type of work, then you use models of understanding. It's either thinking about it or using mathematics to, to do it. E it's easier to use mathematics. And, but, but then there's uncertainties in these models, in these models. And that's very much so. I didn't talk at all about yeah. this. Um, so there's uncertainties in these networks. For instance, I showed that there's this PAH mutation, and I didn't talk about the other parts of the network, but that's also uncertain. So some people have other parts of the network different, and then yet another person who has something else different. So that's an uncertainty we can deal with at this network level. Um, I also do or we, Yanni, for instance, also, you do other types of mathematical models on this, which are more dynamics. This is just about finding your way, but we also have how fast does it go, right? And there you need more parameters, and they are usually uncertain, more uncertain, and that's actually so bad that I presented this and not this other stuff, because the other stuff we can only do for small pathways, not for entire genomes. However, as you've noticed, I'm an optimist. So what we can do in principle, because of the molecular biology evolu uh, revolution, evolution, we can get out these genes, put them in a bacterium, overproduce the, the engine, the machine, the protein, get it secreted, then we have it in a test tube, and then we can measure all the parameters. So ultimately, it's a lot of work, but ultimately we can determine all these, per well, not all. We can determine many of the parameters, I think close to all. But that, you know, that we should do and then run the model and see whether it predicts experimental results. And then I may be right that we're almost there, or I may be wrong that we're only ha halfway there. Because there could be intricate things like these, these molecules, these uh, motor proteins, these uh, engines, machines interacting coming together and they are, the one only works if the other does this, then only this machine does that, and the third one does that. If it's that close-knit, the interactions, then it's hard to know this from studying them independently. So that will have to come out at that stage, uh, that uncertainty as well. Yeah, so that is open. So, you know, you, maybe, yeah, 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 maybe you should just forget all I told you because I'm too optimistic. You know, it's partly an optimistic story. And there's lots of things still to be understood. Yeah. OK, we're just about out of time, but one final question at the back there in the white thing. Good afternoon, and thank you very much. Just a very simple question. If you think of a human being as a machine, systems, engines, as we've spoken, spoken today, what is the influence of cognitive, what you think, what you perceive, what you experience on what's going on in the metabolism? Does that come into play in your well, models? Well, uh, thank, <laughs> thank you for the simple question, but not for... <laughs> 
not for calling it a simple I know, question. I know. It's not a simple question. It's, it's one of the hardest questions we, we can face. So, uh, I th you know, you could say this is quite impossible, but, you know, I'm a bit more optimistic than that. So one of the things you saw here was this dopamine and serotonin, which at least give us some understanding at the biochemical level of how some of this works. However, this then talks about the brain as a whole, and the brain is, is a network in itself that's connected and that is trained, so the connections change by training. And, we, of course, we cannot see for an individual person, at the moment at least, how, what the brain is precisely and what the connections are. There's progress there by, by looking, making images, dynamic imaging of brain, so you see this a bit more, but it's still at the, it doesn't have the required resolution of microns. Uh, that we would need. Maybe, yeah, probably someday we will get that. And then we get a humongous job of interpreting this and calibrating this. So you then have understanding you need to do experiments where it's fine if you have uh, plants or animals, but for humans you can't do the experiments very well. So that's, you know, really a fantastic world of brain research uh, connected to metabolism that is very fascinating and very important uh, in the future. Yeah, so we're doing a little bit of this at the biochemical level, but this other part is still uh, pretty much open, so it's a tough question. Imagine when you're 120, <laughs> we'll know. Yeah, well, the 120, you know, it could have the sad, <laughs> we have the sad connotation that you, we could all be 120, but at 100 we are Parkinson's disease patient. Now, you may have noticed you know, there's, this is about dopamine partly, and it's not a coincidence, you know. So we're really trying also to see whether that, to a, to a large extent, could help us understand Parkinson's disease, or maybe this is only very small. I don't know at the moment. But if you don't try, uh, you, you're not going to know, maybe. Yep. So, yeah, Very good point. Thank you. Keep trying. So, on that note, I wanted to thank everyone for coming uh, today. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. Thanks also for those who joined us online. And those online, please feel free to email us your questions. You're also welcome to participate in the ongoing conversation. Um, thanks to Yanni for a wonderful introduction of Hans and Hans. Uh, we do hope that you'd be uh, working until 100 and beyond because uh, we, you and uh, with your friends, as you said, and uh, we hope uh, that you will consider STIAS as part of that network of friends, and that indeed in future you will call yourself a biochemist from Amsterdam and Stellenbosch. Thank you. I'd like to applaud the audience, actually. So thank you.